Okay, y'all, let's talk about link state under lake control planes real fast and see what we can get through here and uh, just figure out a little bit about data center fabrics using link state. And first, I want to start with this. Which link state protocol should I use for my data center underlay if I'm going to use a link state protocol as the underlay protocol? I obviously have two choices, OSPF and IS to IS. Now, I'm going to say that I generally prefer IS to IS for this role rather than OSPF. I'm going to give you my reasons, but I'm not going to say that using OSPF is wrong. I'm just going to give you my reasons for using IS to IS, and you can take it or leave it. It's entirely up to you what you choose to do with your underlay if you decide to do an underlay using a link state protocol. First of all, ISIS packet formats, the way it builds its packets and the way that it floods tends to be just a bit more efficient than OSPF in many cases. There was a time when OSPF was much more efficient than IS to IS, but over time, OSPF has just added so many options and so much stuff that in the very simple case of a single flooding domain, and even at a large scale in a single flooding domain, ISIS just tends to be a bit more efficient in the way it carries things. Um, second of all, in auto configuration, you don't necessarily even need IP addresses on your fabric links if as long as you have an implementation that allows you to route to unnumbered and things like this. And with IS to IS, you don't need a link or a, an IP address to even bring the adjacency up or the peering session up or actually neighbor adjacency up between two intermediate systems. Now, you can do this with OSPF v3, but most of the time when we're talking about OSPF, we're talking about OSPF v2 rather than OSPF v3. Now, the third big difference is in partial SPF. Now, all implementations or all link state protocols can run partial SPF, but because of the way OSPF builds its packets. It's much more difficult for OSPF to run a partial SPF. And what I'm talking about here is, is if I have a series of routers connected and this link up here, let's call it one colon 100 colon colon slash 64, disappears off the network for some reason, whatever it is. This router down here, let's call it A, will have to run shortest path first even though this is just a leaf node, it doesn't make any difference in the way the tree actually looks. With IS to IS, you natively can run partial, in fact, all implementations of IS to IS that I know, natively run this partial SPF automatically. There's nothing you need to do. OSPF can do this as well, but it typically only does this for externals not for internal. Again, this just goes back to the way the format of the packet is and things like this. Now, a lot of people complain to me that ISIS is so hard to learn, so difficult, and they don't want to deal with IS to IS. It's all those long numbers, and it's weird, and all this other stuff. Look, there are so many resources you can use to learn IS to IS. I've only given you three. There's also Jeff Doyle's book, it has a good section on IS to IS in it. I think um, there's another couple of books that I don't have shown here that are IS to IS. There's this intermediate system. This is six hours of video on IS to IS. Uh, a live lesson is available on Safari Books. I'll probably do an IS to IS series here on Ignition. There's the IS, old IS to IS book by Alvaro Ratana and myself, which has a forward by Mike Sham, one of the people who invented IS to IS, along with Radio Perlman. Um, and he actually reviewed the book, so I know it's pretty good because he didn't give me a lot of negative feedback and what he did, I fixed. Then there's also this book by Ethan and I called Net Computer Networking Problems and Solutions. This has a section on how Link State actually works and talks a bit about ISIS as well. Look, you can just learn ISIS. Get over it and learn it. It's really not that big of a deal. So ISIS, I consider ISIS to be good enough. I have seen ISIS run in much larger networks than you might imagine in a single flat flooding domain. No flooding domain boundaries, no layer, level one, level two to boundaries. Flat out layered, uh, level two large scale flooding domains. I've seen five to 6,000 routers with 10 to 15, 20, 30,000 routes in them. I've seen this, what I show here is I've actually seen a 2,500 plus router, it's actually 2,600 and 20 router network with 120 
6,000 routes in a single floating domain, and it converges at initial convergence in under 40 seconds, and it converges on single link and node failures in only a few seconds, not even a few seconds, a few hundred milliseconds. And this is even in a virtual environment. So you're not running a full on CPU to run ISIS on. You're actually running a part of a processor in this particular case. So there's a lot. ISI scales a lot bigger than you think it does. Link state protocols scale a lot bigger than you think they do. ISI is also good enough because it's widely deployed in very, very large service provider transit networks. Uh, people use ISI at very large scale. Um, again, in a transit provider network, I've seen ISI running in a single le level two flooding domain carrying over 5,000 devices with 10 to 20,000 routes or even larger. There are a lot of strong implementations of IS to IS out there. Um, every implementation I know of of IS to IS is actually pretty darn good. Even the open source FR routing one is really good. Um, of course, Juniper has a really excellent implementation. Cisco has an excellent implementation. Arista has a very good implementation. Even companies that are tend to be smaller, um, like uh, some of these smaller startups tend to start out with very, very good, solid IS to IS implementations. So it's not unusual to see a good one. Now, there are a few I've never worked with. Of course, you know, Huawei's implementation. I have no idea how their implementation is. But I can almost assure you that as large a scale as their networks are in, they are probably have a good IS to IS implementation. So the main two scale issues you run into in running a link state protocol like IS IS on a very high, highly meshed, high ECMP fan out type of topology, like a spine and leaf fabric, like a clo or a butterfly, are these two problems. First, you have wait timers and you have max age. Second thing you have is, is flooding. You just have a lot of flooding in these types of networks. So let's talk a little bit about what this flooding might look like to give you a sense of what the problem is. So let's say this small butterfly fabric is a single level two flooding domain. I often say layer two, and it's really not layer two, it's level two. Uh, it's just a habit from talking about layer two overlays and stretch layer two. Please stop doing that. Anyway, this is a single level two flooding domain. So if I were to look at what's going to happen here, let's say this link fails, right? So this router and this router or intermediate systems, if you want to be technically correct, because it is intermediate system to intermediate system protocol um, I'm tending to use here. But if I'm talking about OSPF, it would be a router. will flood the change to each of its connected devices. So these two devices will flood to all of their connected devices, right? Whatever's left on connected. Those devices, in turn, will flood back to all of their connected devices. So if you start looking at how complex this topology is, this is much like trying to figure out what all the possible paths are for the BGP hunt. Right? This is the same sort of a problem. Um, and the only time the flooding stops is when a device, an intermediate system or a router, receives the same LSP or the same LSA as it's already received. Technically, it's an LSP fragment, but that's okay. That it's already received. So it will then stop reflooding. But you could get a lot of copies. I've seen in large-scale environments as many as 40 to 60 copies of an LSP fragment being received by any particular intermediate system in a large-scale flat level 2 flooding domain in IS to IS. So these can be um, very, very big. Now, when you receive these things, obviously if you receive copies, you're only going to run SPF once, or you're going to run partial, depending on what you're doing. Now again, if I'm running IS to IS, and this link falls off, all of this information is going to be flooded right? But all of these devices are only going to run a partial SPF because this is simply a change. I can't spell. Anyway, a partial SPF because the only thing that changes here is a leaf hanging off of the tree. I'm not changing the connectivity within the tree itself. I'm only changing just one thing. This is very, very fast. There's no SPF run. So we're talking like an SPF run should only take 
10 milliseconds or 8 milliseconds, depending on your box. Um, if you're seeing 100 millisecond SPF runs, you need to do some optimization in your network or do some flooding domain boundaries or something. But anyway, 100, 200 millisecond SPF runs. But normally 8 to 10 milliseconds or even faster in some processors and some implementations. A partial is even faster than that because I'm not even running SPF. I'm just going into my database, my LSDB, and I'm just removing that link. So let's think about some of the timers that we want to talk about in something like a link state protocol. First of all, I have um, wait timers. So there are three kinds of wait timers. The first is my wait timer for when I generate information about a change I've seen in my network. So this might be my advertisement interval or something like that. The second is going to be how long do I wait after receiving a topology change notification. I get an LSP or an LSA. How long will I wait before I run SPF? You know, both of these are settable in most implementations. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through them and how they work because I intend to do a separate video on that at some point in the future. But just remember that those are out there and those are the two types of timers you're talking about. Why would these timers be anything other than zero? Of course, flooding and running SPF require processing resources, memory resources, energy resources on slower processors. Um, switching to the routing process to flood and run SPF is a context switch. It can take a significant amount of time to do this. So you want to reduce the number of context switches and the number of times you run SPF based on getting new information. So you tend to try to gang up changes into groups of changes. So that reduces your processor utilization. If I'm dealing with modern processors and high speed links, what I typically want to do is I want to set my timers to zero. But now, of course, this is going to cause a lot more SPF runs. It's going to cause a lot more flooding. So what you tend to do in these types of situations is you run what is called exponential backup. And again, I'm not going to spend a ton of time here talking about exponential backup because it's its own entire talk. It's, it's very complex, but I will at some point in the future talk about this, I think. But Exponential backoff is a way to allow you to react to the first event quickly, like in zero seconds or just in milliseconds. And then as the changes occur more quickly, to slow down the rate at which you're reacting to those changes. So this allows you to, in a link state protocol, control the speed at which link state changes are reported. The very first change that might happen is reported very quickly. So you get very fast convergence as the network goes faster and faster or something happens in the network, then you cannot or you should not um, react as fast. You should slow down your reaction speed. An interesting thing to talk about here is aggregation black holes. Now, if you're running a distance vector protocol or a protocol or multiple flooding domains or some way where you can actually do at route aggregation, what happens is, is you can end up in an aggregation black hole. This is a design issue you need to think about. So these spine switches in a butterfly, it's interesting to note this, that this spine switch really only has one path to each of these devices and one path to each of the ports connected to those devices. So what happens is, let's say I have this 100 colon colon slice 64 down here. And tier three, say this is my super spine or my fab layer, is only advertising a default out. So this is what I do, is I advertise a default out, and this allows me to reduce the amount of state in my network, right? This is what I typically do with aggregation. Now what happens if this link right here fails. This is my single path from A3, this router or intermediate system, to reach this destination. A2, this router right here, is still going to be using ECMP to spread the load across these two links. It does not know, it has no way, A2 has no way of knowing that A3 has lost all of its connectivity to this reachable destination down here. So as, as it sends traffic to A3, this traffic is going to be thrown into the garbage can, right? All that traffic is going to go into the garbage can and it's just going to go away. This is a routing black hole. Now, one thing you can do is you can do auto disaggregation in this case. This is what a protocol called Rift does. And I'm going to spend a little time talking more about Rift in another section here, but I just want to describe how auto disaggregation works. So in this case, Let's say that we have this situation where this link fails. A2 will notice that 
A3 does not have the same set of neighbors that it does any longer. It doesn't have connectivity to A4. So what it's going to do is it's going to tell A3, please send me all of your routes, or at least send me the routes that you can only reach via this broken link, whatever this broken link happens to be. Um, so that is auto disaggregation. This has been implemented in EIGRP. It was never actually deployed or shipped in EIGRP, but it was implemented in EIGRP um, for a while. And it is implemented in this Rift protocol. Uh, there are a lot of other features that we can talk about, and uh, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about Rift in another section. Some other aggregation things that you can do uh, in terms of a data center fabric is just don't aggregate. If I'm able to scale my underlay protocol to 120,000 routes and 2,600 devices, why do I care about aggregation? Again, what I'm trying to do in my data center fabric is build vertical layers, an underlay, an overlay, and potentially like a controller or an orchestration layer or whatever the case might happen to be, in order to build a larger, flatter network fabric or module so that I don't need to deal with some of these things within that module. Um, so if I can really scale out, why do I need to aggregate? So my first piece of advice is don't aggregate within this data center fabric if you don't need to. Another option is something that's never really been implemented. Well, it's implemented in Cisco IOS and again, never really shipped as far as I know, which is to do compression between the routing table and the FIB and the, um, the, the forwarding table itself or the device the physical device that's doing the forwarding. Well, that's all we're going to do for this session. Um, I will continue in the next session and talk about um, some other issues, um, some more advanced underlay protocols and modifications in Rift and things like that.